Hi everybody, my name is Pastor Dave Myers. I'm the lead pastor here at Royal Oak Victory Church. And thanks for joining in on the message today. My prayer is that it'll strengthen your faith, encourage your heart, and speak something powerful into your life. If it turns out to be a blessing, would you please consider sharing it with someone else as one of our passions here at ROVC is to get the word out to as many people as possible. And so without further ado, let's jump right into today's message. Good to see everybody out, and um, you've had your first, second, third, fifth cup of coffee. Uh, we're okay. Um, how many love daylight savings? You know, well, okay. Um, but anyway, uh, great to see all of you, and it's so neat to see that we can touch the world. Uh, from this place and to be able to partner uh, with our team there in Zambia and actually send kids to school. And of course those kids are, uh, they belong to pastors who, you know, um, over there when you're a pastor, uh, you need a second job, a third job just to pay the bill. So it's really neat and appreciate everybody's faithfulness in that. Um, but those of you who've been with us for the past several Sundays now, you know we've been moving in a series entitled Last Day Survival Guide, uh, a journey through the book of Thessalonians. And I realize that that's not the most popular book, well-known book in the Bible, but it is a book all the same, uh, First Thessalonians. And um, we've been journeying through the book. I'm actually going to be concluding the uh, series today uh, because we're in the fifth chapter. But just this week when I was preparing for this message, my curiosity got the best of me. And um, so I grabbed my um, faithful laptop, I went on almighty Google search engine, I typed in the words, um, last day survival guide. And uh, I must admit, I was uh, a little overwhelmed, to be honest, at what I found. Uh, because there was website after website after website exclusively devoted to the topic of surviving uh, what uh, many call the worldwide apocalypse. How many have ever heard of that? Yeah, it's closer than you think. Um, but there's a lot of website, a lot of information on there. And, um, you know, it got into a lot of detail. Uh, everything from how to secure a clean source of water. How many of you know um, if you're in a third world war and, um, and, and a, a nuclear meltdown, you need clean water? Uh, it talked about how to have short-term and long-term food. And I didn't know this, but you can actually buy the, this kind of food that lasts for 25 years. I don't know what it tastes like. I don't know if you'd want to eat it, but it lasts for a long time. It talked about uh, having um, your own power source off the grid. You've got to be off the grid. It talked about growing a survival garden, uh, learning how to trap and hunt and fish and foliage for yourself, all those kinds of things. Everything you needed to know uh, in an event of a worldwide nuclear meltdown. Lots of stuff on the web. And I suppose it might come in handy uh, if you were going to be around for it. But how many of you know we're not? And uh, if you're wondering what that means, last Sunday, uh, if you weren't here, um, I, uh, I shared a message on uh, what uh, uh, is called the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ. And it's out of the, uh, the fourth chapter of Thessalonians. And if you weren't here, I would encourage you to go on our website um, and listen to the sermon. I think you'll find it very encouraging. Uh, that's what we looked at last week. But, you know, this morning what I'd like to do is, as I said, wrap this series up. We're going to bring it to a close by looking at what I call the one thing. One thing. Let's say that together. One thing. One thing, the one thing um, that all of us will need in order to effectively, successfully survive these last days. And, you know, it may surprise you um, because it's not clean water, uh, it's not food, it's not a reliable source of electricity, as important as all those things are, uh, but rather it's something even more fundamental than all of that, if you can imagine and so we're going to look at it this morning. And so if you have your Bibles, uh, turn them on or turn them to First uh, Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, verse 1. I'll be reading out of the New Living Translation for those of you who have a Bible app. 
and uh, use a variety of translations, but the words will come up on the screen. And so this is Paul, the apostle, writing. He said, now concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write you. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night. When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin and there will be no escape. And so, of course, what Paul is talking about here is none other than the last days. Another phrase would be the end times, the end of the world. And, of course, we see that because he calls it the day of the Lord's return. He uses that phrase. And yet, what I find interesting is that uh, uh, when Paul talks about the last days, the end of the world, he doesn't give us a long list um, of things to get ready for it, like shelter, like food, like electricity, water. He, he, he doesn't mention any of that, but rather he just focuses on one thing. Let's say that together. One thing. And, um, you know, that one thing comes out here in this verse. It says, now concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters. Dear brothers and sisters. It's just interesting that uh, when Paul chooses to address the church, he doesn't call them members. He doesn't call them congregates or attenders or supporters, but rather he calls them dear brothers and sisters. Um, of course, this isn't the first time he does this. If you're familiar with Paul's writings, um, uh, many times, actually over 60 times in his letters, he uses the phrase brothers and sisters. In 1 Thessalonians and 2, he uh, mentions it as many as 27 times, which tells me that one of the greatest needs we have in the last days is not a bunker to hide out in, with a year's supply of food and water, but rather one of the greatest, most pressing needs we have as we live in these last days is what the Bible calls spiritual family. Spiritual family. Paul says brothers, Paul says sisters. I'm talking about spiritual moms and dads. That is the one thing that I believe we need to connect with more now than we ever have before. God's family called the church. And so we're going to look at that this morning, the beauty of the last day family, and see some of the uh, qualities of it. And so how many are ready to learn a few things this morning? You ready? Okay. Turn to the person next to you. Say, welcome to the family. Yeah, just welcome them. And so, um, you know, the first thing we see here in this chapter, and I'm just going to go through the chapter, um, uh, the first thing we see is what I call family leadership. And the reality is you can't have a strong, growing, safe, secure, healthy family unless in the same breath you have strong, healthy leadership guiding it. And, of course, Paul talks about that in verse 12. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work. Uh, of course, what Paul is talking about here is spiritual leadership. And he tells us what we ought to do with our spiritual leaders, our pastors, our elders, who are over us. He says we're to love them, we're to encourage them. In fact, one translation says, honor those leaders who work hard for you, who have been given the responsibility of urging and guiding you along in your obedience. Overwhelm them with appreciation and with love. That's what the message translation says. Overwhelm them. And what that means is uh, going above and beyond to make sure that our pastors... And uh, you have a pastor, and maybe that's me, and I have a pastor, uh, because we belong to an organization called Victory Churches, and my spiritual mom and father are Pastor George and Hazel Hill. And so we want to make sure that we honor them. We want to make sure that we value them and respect them and appreciate them. Um, that is what uh, last day 
leadership is all about. Because it, you remember what Jesus said. Um, he, he gave us the strategy of the, of the devil. He said that if you smite the shepherd, if you weaken the shepherd, if you're able to take out the leader, the shepherd, then all the rest of the sheep will be scattered. And that's why we want to go the extra mile when it comes to supporting, encouraging, and praying for, and loving our pastors and leaders. And, you know, I don't say that because I'm not getting it. Um, Clarice and I feel very honored by all of you. We feel very supported and loved by all of you. We really do. Um, it is one of the ways to keep your pastors encouraged. And notice here that it's not based on who they are, uh, but rather it's based on the work they do, how they faithfully serve. And Paul says that. He says, show them great respect and wholehearted love. Why? Because of their work. Because of the work. And so what that means is even if your pastor isn't the most charismatic person in the world. Even if your pastor isn't the most brilliant or funny or relational person on the planet. We are called to love and respect them all the same. And so even if your pastor doesn't have the hair and teeth of Joel Olstein, Which many of us don't. You encourage him anyway, amen, even if your pastor doesn't have the, 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 the passion and charisma of Stephen Furtek. You encourage and support them anyway, even if your pastor doesn't have the biblical depth and insight of Dr. John MacArthur. You love and respect them all the same because it's based on not who they are, but what they do, what they do. And I'll tell you, if your pastor has God's heart for you, if your pastor is praying and crying out in prayer for you, if your pastor is faithful at teaching and preaching the word then, and, and using his gifts and ability as, as clumsy as that might seem sometimes, then that is surely, that is, that, is, that is enough to say, Lord, bless our pastors and our spiritual leadership. And we need to do that more in these last days than ever before. The writer of Hebrews says it this way. He says, obey your spiritual leaders. I could preach a whole sermon just on that one right there. Do what they say. But I'll move on. Their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow because that would not be for your benefit. In other words, what the writer of Hebrews is saying here is that as Christ followers, it's important that we listen. Not just listen, but obey our spiritual leaders. Um, because um, one day, one day I am going to have to stand before God and give an account of all of you. It's an interesting thought. How did that one do? How did that one do? How did that one do? What about that one over there? That guy over there. No, I just. <laughs> How'd they do? And I'd say, well, Lord, most of them did really good. They really did. They really did good. But there was the odd one. Turn to the person next to you and say, it's not you. <laughs> there was the odd one that didn't listen. They were rebellious, hard headed, apathetic lethargic, and it says that if I have to do that, it will be unprofitable not to me, but to who? Where's that verse? Put it up again. Can we do that? Is it, it would be, that would not be for your benefit, amen? Amen. And so that's why we need spiritual leadership. That's why we want to honor them and pray for them. How many love me even though I said that? Okay. And so that's the first thing I see about family is family, uh, last day family leadership. You know, the next thing is family behaviors. And how many know good behavior? It's a must. Good behavior is a must to have a, have a sane, strong family. And uh, I remember when our kids were younger... 
Now, of course, we have grandkids, but when our boys were younger, we worked overtime. Clarice and I worked overtime, teaching, modeling, right behavior. Over and over and over again. Don't chew with your mouth open. That was a big one for Clarice. And she would train them on that and always say please and thank you. That was a big one for me. Share your toys with your siblings. Be kind to those around you. Value your elders. Work hard in school. Study. We drilled it and drilled it into them. Um, That's what is required for a strong family. And, you know, that's not only true in the natural, it's true in the spiritual as well. Paul tells us exactly what kind of behaviors we should have as God's family. You see it here. He says, brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are what? Lazy. Lazy. You know, the word lazy in the Greek is actually a military term. It means to be undisciplined, unruly, out of rank. You're kind of out of step. And Paul here says that um, if there's someone in the church who's behaving that way, They're lazy, they're undisciplined, they're out of step, they're unruly. Don't just pat them on the head and say, Jesus loves you just the way you are. He does love you, but he loves you enough to see that you get changed and transformed. Amen? Don't just love them. Um, Love them enough to warn them. And just tell them, take them aside and in love, tell them that their behavior is hindering them from becoming all they can be in Christ. That is called family behavior. Paul goes on to say, um, warn those who are lazy, encourage those who are timid. One translation says, cheer up those who are discouraged. And that's really what the word means, discouraged. And I think all of us get that way from time to time. I know I do. Discouraged and um, depressed and despondent, downcast. And Paul says here, we are to encourage people who are in that state. In other words, to come alongside of them and, and, and lift them up and and, and to tell them, hey, I'm praying for you. You can make it. We're in this together. This too shall come to pass. And um, I am always blessed whenever someone comes to me when I'm in a discouraging day or season in my life and, 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 and encourages me. It, it goes so far. You know, the writer of Proverbs says it like this in Proverbs 12, 25, worry weights a person down. How many of you know it's true? Anxiety and worry pulls us down. It discourages us. It's like a ball and chain. Worry and weighs a person down, but an encouraging word cheers them up. And so I want to encourage you to be doing more of that around here. When you see somebody who hasn't been coming to church, call them up, connect with them. If you find out someone who's really discouraged and going through a rough time, connect with them, pray for them, lift them up. I mean, encourage them. That's what it means to do that. That is a healthy family behavior. You know, another one here is to, uh, and I love this, take tender care of those who are weak. What a neat way to describe the compassion of God. Take tender care for those who are weak. And you know, the the weak here uh, isn't talking about weak in body or weak in mind. It's talking about those who are weak in faith. And Paul says here that the way we are to respond to those who are weak in faith, feeble in faith, is not to hit them over the head with the Bible and say, you need to stand on the word more. You need, to, you, need to, you need to believe God more. You, 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 you need to have more faith. That's not the way to do it, right? Paul says that uh, when we come across those who are weak in faith, we need to tenderly care for them. I love that. Go out of our way and with com- the compassion of Christ, care for them. 
And um, I've appreciated the times when people have done that to me, when I have been weak in faith, going through a season where my faith seems like it's nothing, feeble and frail, and people have come and encouraged me. And so I want to encourage you to do that. I think our church is awesome in that. I, I, I would rally you to do it even more. And to have those healthy family behaviors. You know, the last one here, it says, um, take tender care of those who are weak. Be patient with who? With, with who? Everyone. With everyone. You know, I looked up that word everyone. You know what it means? It means everyone. It means the, uh, the everyone. The everyones we like. And the every ones we don't like as much. It means the every ones uh, uh, who are sweet to us and nice to us. And the every ones who are sour and mean to us. It's the every ones who are fun to be around. We all have people who are fun to be around and, and they encourage us. But it also means the every ones who irritate us and rub us the wrong way. The brother and sister sandpaper. Turn to the person next to you say, that's not you. Even if you have to say it in faith. <laughs> Paul says we need to be patient with everyone, everyone, every single one of us. We need to be patient. And, you know, I think we live in a world of great impatience. I mean, you can see it. It's like a powder keg. People get cut off on the, on the freeway by accident. Next thing they know, they bring out a gun and there's, there's a gunfight right on the freeway. People can't stand in line, be patient. People can't be kind and considerate. And so we as Christians, wow, just by doing that, being patient and loving with everyone, that, that, that's a testimony. That's a light in a dark place. And so we've looked at family leadership. We've touched on family behaviors. The next one is family worship. In other words, what ought we to be doing? What are the fundamental things we, as God's people, ought to do when it comes to connecting and worshiping with God? And Paul gives us a few things here. He says, always be joyful. Always be joyful. You know, the word joy here in the Greek is hiero, and it literally means full and overflowing. Full and overflowing. Have full and overflowing joy. So that when you're having a good day, you are full and overflowing. When you're having a bad day, you are full and overflowing. When you're on the mountaintop and everything is going well and perfect and grand, you are full and overflowing. And when you are in the valley and everything that can possibly go wrong does, you are still full and overflowing with joy. Always be joyful. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, you know, that's the problem with you pastors. You're so impractical. You don't really live in the real world. I mean, it's so unrealistic to think that you could be joyful in everything and over everything. How can that be? Well, the key to all of this is not found in ourselves. Uh, we're too limited and insufficient to be able to do that in ourselves. But uh, we certainly are able to get there through the help of Christ and what he is in us. Amen? His sufficiency. Christ in us. That's how we do it. And you know, that's exactly what Jesus himself said. He gave us a great promise in John 15, verse 11. He said, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be filled. And so let me ask you, according to this verse, just whose joy is Jesus speaking of here? Whose? His. It's his. Jesus says, uh, I have spoken to you these things that my joy, my joy may remain in you. And I love that because I found out a long time ago that Christ's joy, his brand of joy, is far more superior in quality than my own. It's his joy. It's his joy. It's the joy of heaven. It's the very joy of God. 
It's the very joy that takes place. The Bible says every time a sinner repents, all of heaven is rejoicing, saturated in joy. And that's the kind of joy that Christ wants to give us. That's the first thing I see here. But you know, the other thing is notice where this gift of joy is located. Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain, where? In you. Turn to the person next to you, say, it's in you. It's in you. His joy is in us. His joy is in us. In other words, it's not way up there in heaven and I'll get it someday when I leave this dark, depression world behind. It's not in this thing or this place or this circumstance or this person or this job or this high. It's not there. The very joy of heaven, the joy of Christ is living deep within our hearts. And because of that, think about it. It doesn't matter what's going on around us on the outside. All hell could be breaking loose on the outside. The wheels of our lives could be falling out on the outside, but because we have God's supernatural joy on the inside, we can still tap into the ceaseless rivers of it. That's his promise to us. That's why we can always be joyful. And I think that some of us, because we, all of us experience that. Some of us have lost our joy. We really have. I really feel that some of us have been bound by even a, a heavy spirit that has come upon us. And I get it. I mean, we live in a, in, in, in a difficult season. We, we live in a dark world. And, and I, I, I'm, I pray, Father, that every dark spirit of depression will be broken over people's lives right now. And Father, I release a new anointing of joy and rejoicing over your people in this place today that we might rise up and be the light that you've called us to be in this dark and broken world. Amen? Amen. And so, um, so that's uh, family worship. Always be joyful. Paul says, never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. He says, do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecy. You know, this word stifle literally means to extinguish like a flame. It's actually a picture word of what happens to a candle, the flame of a candle when you come and you extinguish it. And Paul says here that when it comes to the Holy Spirit, we ought not to do that. We ought not to extinguish the power and the person of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Don't do it. Now, you might be here saying, well, how is that even possible? How is it possible that someone so powerful and mighty as the, as the Holy Spirit... How can someone as grand and majestic as as that be extinguished and quenched? Well, he can. He really can. We can extinguish the Holy Spirit in our lives. And, you know, some of the ways we do it is by um, ignoring him. We don't even know he's around, right? We don't even realize he's available, the wonderful person of the Holy Spirit who Jesus said, you know, it's better that I go away. Because when I go away, I can give you the comforter, the comforter, the advocate. He'll be with you always. And yet sometimes we can live our lives just going day by day, not even paying any attention to him. You know, another way we extinguish the Holy Spirit is by limiting him. We put God in a box. God does this and not that. God moves in this way, but not in that way. And whenever he tries to do something new, we shut it down. We shut it down. We just, it's just like that flame. We quench it because we think we got God figured out. And so that's how you can limit the Holy Spirit. You know, another way to extinguish him is disobeying him. And I think we're all guilty for this. You know, God, sometimes God will say, I want you to go over and talk to that person. You know, if I'm at, you know, a store or picking something up, I'll say, no way. Yeah, I want you to go talk to him. Tell him that I love him. 
And I say, no way. I'm in a real rush. I got to get home with these bananas <laughs> and bread. My wife will kill me. The Holy Spirit tells us to say this or go there or do this thing. And we disobey him. And I'll tell you, you do that over and over. I mean, all of us do it sometimes. We all do. But you do it over and over again. Over and over, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, putting his finger on things in your life, and you resist him over and over and over again. Well, you can be sure that is extinguishing the presence and power of him in your life. That's the last thing we need in the end times is a church that's gone out that isn't filled with the Spirit, that isn't following the Spirit, so we can extinguish him by ignoring, limiting, disobeying, and then the last thing is exchanging him. In other words, we exchange him for other things. You know, things like alcohol and drugs or sex or money or friendship or success. You know, Paul said it in Ephesians, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we are in the habit of exchanging, right? Jesus calls him the comforter, and yet when we are in a state of discomfort, what do we do? We go everywhere else but to him to find comfort. We grab the alcohol. We grab that big tub of ice cream and we zone out on Netflix, and um, we miss the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I want to encourage you, and there's so much that could be said about this, but as a last day church, let's stay filled with the Holy Spirit, hungry for him in our lives, crying out, calling out for him. Just like the psalmist said, as the deer pants for the water broke, Lord, I'm panting, I'm thirsting for more of you. Come, fill me, fill my family, fill my marriage, fill every church that preaches your word with the power and light of your Holy Spirit. Amen? Have I had too much coffee? Amen. Family, leadership, family behaviors, family worship. And then the last one is family commitments. In other words, some of the things we are to prioritize and commit ourselves to as we journey our way through these last days. And you see them here. Paul says, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. Test everything. You know, this word test means to examine, to prove, to scrutinize, to inspect. And here Paul says that we are to do it with how many things? Everything. Everything. We need to scrutinize and test everything. Everything. And the reason why we need to do that in the last days is because Jesus warned us that one of the major signs that will take place in the last days, one of the biggest signs of the last days is not wars. That's one of them. It's not earthquakes. It's not pestilence. That's, that's some of them. But one of the greatest signs in the last days will be a flood tide of darkness and deception that will fill the earth. He said it over and over again in Matthew chapter 24. Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and deceive many. In verse 11, he says, for many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And in verse 24, he says, for false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. It's many who will come and many who will be deceived. It's a sign of the end times. And that's why one of the greatest commitments we can ever make in these last days is the commitment to prove. I'm going to prove and test and examine and scrutinize everything I see and hear going on around me because much of it will be filled with deception. And so when someone comes to you and says that there are over 107 different kinds of genders, 
you scrutinize. And you say, well, that's not proven in science. Science hasn't proven that. And one thing is for sure, the Bible doesn't say that. In fact, the Bible says that there's only, how many? Two, male and female. He created them. In his image, he created them. And so we need to scrutinize those things. And I just, I just want to say as parents, pray for your kids more now than ever. Cover them in prayer because they are right on the front lines of some of this stuff. You know, when someone comes to you saying that um, the greatest threat facing humanity today is climate change, don't just take that hook, line, and sinker and get on Turnberg's wagon. Sorry, I'll try and not get political here. Um, um, I mean, just, 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 just see what the Bible says. The Bible says that the greatest threat to the world right now is not climate change. It's a flood tide of unbridled sin and rebellion and disobedience against God. And until that can be addressed, we're not going in the right direction anyway. We're not. I mean, look at what, what, what Peter said in 2 Peter 3.10. But the day of the Lord will come as the thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. This is what I call global warming. <laughs> and if you think, anyway, I better behave myself. If you think getting an electric car is going to stop this, you got another thing coming, brother. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, get the electric car. I mean, that's fine. We need to be good stewards of the earth. But I'll tell you, climate change is not the biggest problem in the world today. We have a world that's going to hell in a handbasket. And God has given us, the church, a mission to do all we can to turn it around and to love it back to him. That is what he's called us to do. And so those are some of the commitments. The commitments is to, uh, to find out what is right and what is wrong, discern what is light, what is darkness, to, uh, to, to scrutinize what is Christ and of his kingdom and what is of Satan and his dark world. And once we figure out what it is, what is true and righteous and pure, we are to hold on to it with all our might. Paul says, test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Hold on, hold on, hold on to what is good. One translation says, hold, hold firmly. Another one says, hold fast. Another one says, hold tightly to what is proven to be right. The word hold means to seize with great force. And that is the commitment we are called to make in these last days. We find out what's right, what's true, what's noble, what's pure, and we hold on to it with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Family commitments. But you know, the only way we can do that is by having the strength of a spiritual family around us. It all happens in the context of family. One thing we will need more of in these last days is exactly that. One another, family. Family where we can learn together and grow together and share together and pray together and worship together and laugh together and cry together and do life together. We need each other. We need family. And that's why the writer of Hebrews says what he does. In Hebrews 10, 25, he says, this is not the time. It's not the time to pull away and neglect meeting together as some have formed the habit of doing. Because we need each other. In fact, we should come together even more frequently, eager to encourage and urge each other onward as we anticipate that day dawning. And, of course, that dawning day that the writer is speaking of here is the, the day when Jesus comes and takes us home to heaven. 
And the writer says that as that day is approaching, and I'll tell you, it's getting closer. We're closer now than we've ever been before. And the writer says, as that day is getting closer, let's not get in the habit of segregating and isolating ourselves and getting so busy we have no time to celebrate family. But he says, let's do it all the more. Let's engage and build and commit and connect all the more as we see the day approaching. Amen. And you know, here at ROVC, we are so passionate about this that it's one of our core ministries, uh, our connect groups. And you know, when you came in, you saw a flyer. There's a flyer on your seat. Um, And I'm going to just speak into that in just a minute. But before I do, I want you to put put your attention on the screen. One of our core values here at ROVC is growing authentically together. And that is what we are encouraging every one of you to do in a connect group. Because the best way to grow is in relationship. And the best place to do it is in a small group. Connect groups is the place for you to step into and keep growing in relationship. And where you learn to put what you believe into practice. In connect groups, we are committed to love one another and enjoy each other's company and also eat together. In connect groups, we ask questions and learn together and encourage each other in our faith. In connect groups, we reflect on God's goodness and we worship and pray together. In connect groups, we are there for each other and come alongside those that hurt or need extra support. And in connect groups, we are always ready to extend God's love into the world and welcome new members into the family of God. Let's step into community and experience the joy of walking and growing together. At ROBC, there is a connect group for you. Why don't you join one today? Amen. Connect groups for everyone. Why don't we all join one today? And you know, on the, in that flyer you have on your seat, I'm not going to take a long time, but uh, we have some great groups uh, that are starting up, new groups that we've never offered before. Um, of course, a lot of our uh, con- continuous groups are going on, but you know, uh, w- one of the new groups there Tuesday uh, evening is our Legacy Young Adults. How many young adults do we have here? Let's give a hoot and a holler. Okay, good, yeah. And I'll tell you, they have a great time Tuesday night right here at the church at 7, so you want to take that into consideration. You know, one uh, brand new group there, you see it on Tuesday night, is Signs of the End of the Age. It's a, it's a study of end times. And so we've only been able to scratch the surface on that, but we're going to have a whole group for that, and um, that'll be Dean and Sue Hughes will be teaching that. Wednesday group, I like this one, it's called Gentle exercise class. I might join that. I like the word gentle there. <laughs> that, that's my kind of group. Um, uh, Thursday, look at, we have some brand new men's groups that are so exciting. Look at that. Thursday morning, we have men of valor breakfast. Whoa! And um, that is taking place at 6.30 a.m. How many know that separates the men from the boys right there? And Shane will be leading that. You know, another brand new men's group is Saturday morning. Look at that. 8 a.m. Men's Academy Authentic Manhood. And uh, that's another group we're doing. But there's so many. And so I would encourage you, don't just go home and throw this in the trash, in the recycle. Um, These groups are launching this week. We'd love you to be part of it. You can scan the QR code or you can just go online and sign up. It's easy to sign up. Just go on there, sign up, and we'll see you out. And we'll do life together. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the beauty of family. Um, I thank you for the beauty of the ROVC family. I thank you for the encouragement that they've been to Clarice and I and our whole family throughout these many years. 
Uh, I fa Father, I thank you for the family that you're building here. Uh, we started as a small mustard seed, and now we're turning into a royal oak. And Father, I pray that you would um, continue to knit us together. Forgive us for separating. Forgive us for being lone rangers, Father. Help us. Give us the grace to step in a little bit closer uh, to you and to your wonderful family called the church. And Father, I thank you for it. Pray it in Jesus' name. Everyone, amen. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. Amen. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching the message today, and I hope that it lifted and encouraged you in some way. If you made a decision to follow Christ today, we would love to know about it. And the best way to do that, to let us know, is by heading over to our website at rovc.ca and clicking on the tab that says connect with us. Also, if this message was a blessing to you, we'd love it if you could get the word out by liking and subscribing or even giving to our ministry. If you're interested in making a donation, you can do so by heading again to our website and clicking on the Give tab. Again, thanks for joining us and may God richly bless you.